All right, hey, hey, everyone. So I want to take this time now to think about another uh, author. Probably, in my mind, uh, is my, probably my favorite author, um, favorite writer, and he's one that I'm pretty sure no one's ever heard of. And his name is Roberto Calasso. Now, Calasso's an Italian. Um, he, and he's currently in uh, Florence, I believe, and he's an editor of um, lead head editor, or what would his actual title be? Well, officially, he's the uh, chairman of Adelphi since uh, 1999, but he's a publisher, and that is primarily what he has done. But since about 1994, and a little bit before then, uh, with some shorter pieces, uh, he's been he, he's been releasing books of his own. Now, he has a doctorate in, um, I guess, uh, ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and there's a whole thing about that that I'm not totally familiar with because I'm not familiar with that um, that field. But aside from that, he's brilliant. Uh, he, he's fluent in, and I've seen his interviews, he's fluent in French, Spanish, English, uh, German, Latin, and, and Greek, um, and Italian, of course. And he's also uh, proficient in Sanskrit. So his works deal with a, an array, like a vast array of different topics, which makes him such an important thinker in that way. Uh, but some of the some of his uh, topics include myth, how myth informs uh, contemporary public consciousness, how it informs the way we look at history, how we look at philosophy, and how all these things, I guess, intertwine. So in some ways, uh, I guess the good way to um, Go about presenting him would be about giving a brief summary of each of his works. So the first one, The Ruin of Cash, which is the one I'll be looking at today, deals with uh, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand, who was a uh, worked under Napoleon. And I'll get more into that. And then, as it says on the back cover, it is a text. This is a text that deals with uh, Talleyrand, but then it is also a text about everything else, at least according to Talo Calvino. And that is really true. Colasso deals with a whole array of things in this book, so that's why I hope to get started on it rather quickly, but before then, a little bit more of a preface. He also has a, books, a book on uh, Hinduism and the uh, gods of India, which is extremely fascinating, and it's um, very, it's really a beautiful book. Uh, he also has another book on Greek mythology, a number of other books on literature, on Kafka, on Baudelaire, on art with uh, Tia Polo, and a whole, like, it's unbelievable. He really is a brilliant uh, individual that I think would have read almost everything. Now, to get into this text, it's a little bit difficult to, to present, and it's a little bit difficult to sift out uh, key themes, because it's really all over the place. One minute, you know, he's talking about the French Revolution, the next minute he's talking about Pol Pot. The next minute, he's talking about the ancient city of Kash, the ancient kingdom of Kash in Africa. So it really is all over the place. But there is a central theme, and it's important, I think, that I bring this up because it, I will be coming back to it, and to have a kind of base would be important or will help. So it deals primarily with the topic of sacrifice or the topics of sacrifice, ceremony, and I guess symbolic the, this, the domain of the symbolic, or the domain of the unknown, I will say rather hesitantly. Now, th this stands, so he's thinking about modernity in this way, and he's thinking about what necessarily occurred at the moment that we classified as modernity, or the advent of enlightenment thinking, notably the coming into scientific rationality, and what that meant for superstition, for myth, anything like this that had real effects on how people engaged in their day-to-day -day lives. So we asked some questions, has there been uh, an effective um, obfuscation of those previous modes of understanding the world? Have they retained their meaning in just different ways today? So he's, he, these questions are always kind of in the back of his mind, and he, and he works through them by presenting a whole array of literary and historical illusions. So on that note, this was a rather long intro. 
Uh, let's jump right into it. So he begins this book by presenting a passage from Talleyrand. Now it's unclear as to whether or not this is actually from Talleyrand or if it was this is Colasso's interpretation of Talleyrand as an individual. And it goes as follows. I speak at the threshold of this book because I was the last man to know anything about ceremonies, and I speak, as always, to deceive. This book is not dedicated to me or to anyone else. This book is dedicated to dedication. Now, who the hell was Talleyrand? Let's get into that. So Charles-Maurice de, Charles de Talleyrand, Perigot, was a uh, lay sized French bishop, politician, and diplomat. So this is from Wikipedia here to kind of summarize it up. After theology studies, he became, in 1780, agent general of the clergy and represented the Catholic Church to the French crown. He worked at the highest levels of, levels of successful successive governments, most commonly as foreign minister or in some other diplomatic capacity. His career spanned the regimes of Louis XVI, the years of the French Revolution, Napoleon, uh, Louis XVIII, and Louis Philippe, or Louis Philippe. Those he served often distrusted Talleyrand, but like Napoleon, found him extremely useful. The name Talleyrand has become a byword for crafty, cynical diplomacy. Now, what I want to take from that, that little description, is that one of the important factors, or key elements, was that he was disliked. Now, that's key to what how uh, Colasso views him here. So, beyond being disliked, Colasso suggests that Talleyrand was superior, in a sense, um, to everyone else because he held a certain uh, disposition towards, um, I guess, indifference or apathy, where through his indifference, he was able to grasp concepts and ideas be far better than anyone else, and didn't, by not taking anything too seriously, was able to really flow from place to place, which made him a very powerful adversary for other people in the political sphere because he was able to really adapt and accommodate different ideas and different perspectives, making him really uh, a, a, a very eclectic person. And again, quoting Talleyrand here, Colasso, uh, or according, according to Colasso, Talleyrand stated that once in my youth, and even in later years, when I loved adventure novels and melodramas, I saw that what enthralled me was uncertainty about people's identity. So this is key. Because if we consider this idea of identity, it is surely an ambiguous one. And no one is as certain as they are in their identity as almost anything else, which for Talleyrand, at least how he understood it, was total hogwash. There was no such thing as an unchanging, um, I guess, determined identity. So in that capacity as... Oh, I got turned down. In that capacity, as Colasso makes clear, a Talleyrand so using its name as a, a noun, cannot allow anything to be taken from him, but he will all allow himself to give away everything, especially if what he bestows is a gift gift, a poison present, an object of, its, of his private hatred, for example, ecclesiastical privileges, which came with a job, the job of being a bishop that the in, innate despotism of his parents had forced him to take. So... We, we hear resonating within this the idea of the gift, of course, so we think of mouse, and in what way does gift giving uh, allot someone a certain privileged position? Well, according to mouse, it's because you give a, if you give a gift, you should expect a greater, um, a greater, never really equal, but it could be equal gift in the form of uh, a counter gift. So that would give the person who gives the initial gift a uh, degree of superiority over the person who has to reciprocate. Now, because Talleyrand has such a proficient understanding of this thing called, or the ambiguity of identity, he was prepared to dispose of anything he had, which by giving it away in that sense, by, by um, I guess, unburdening himself with certain things, he was able to gain a certain command over those around him. So if we understand modernity as being that point, at least in part, that turning point in history when identity, as it was associated with anything symbolic, anything superstitious, anything mythical, uh, was being taken away in favor of a sort of 
determinacy in the, under the aegis of a scientific rationality or scientific determinism, um, Talleyrand was very prepared to accommodate that, precisely because he understood that there could be no such thing as a finality. There could be no such thing as an endpoint to history, an endpoint to development, or anything like that. Just as there was no, no endpoint to this thing called identity that he himself was prepared to shed at any point, which made him a prime candidate for this entering the new age. Or, as Calasso puts it much better than I ever could, he writes that Talleyrand was the first to understand that the new world, the one that emerged from the Napoleonic age, expecting to find a state of equilibrium, no longer expected or demanded a law, but wanted the semblance of a law. Now that semblance, difficult to necessarily grasp, but we can only assume that because there was associated with, I guess, the divine right of, of man or, or the um, kind of Lockean sent sentiments with regards to the law or anything like that, all of this is simply a trompe l'oeil, right? It's just a trick of the eye that is intended to convince us of there being this thing called the law that can manifest itself in one singular a priori way. Now, Talleyrand did not believe in that very clearly, but he was precisely because he knew that it was just a joke and that it would just, it would be, I guess, up for evaluation, although subtly, he was able to, I guess, steer it because of his uh, privileged position within politics. All this because Talleyrand had the knowledge of what preceded it. So what preceded this thing called modernity was, in a sense, ambiguity, was, in a sense, more closely aligned with this impossibility of identity. So what stands opposed to Talleyrand in this thing called Western, uh, Western theory, for Calasso goes as follows, where any Western theory of legitimacy is deficient in one respect, it knows nothing of the waters of origin, which is something that Talleyrand had an interesting knowledge of. And some of the key figures in that, at least how Calasso, Calasso points to, and it, it's odd that he would pick the two following thinkers and then he goes after a whole array of them uh, for committing the same um, fault as Western modernity, but he focuses on Nietzsche and Freud. Of this, he says that tradition no longer enables one to claim an origin, but now conceals it. All the great and terrible enlighteners down to Nietzsche and Freud have been fanatical seekers of origins and genealogies. Herein lay the Western world's pecu peculiar ne nephes, which attracted and dazzled them. If one could fill the gap of that missing origin, they thought, one could at least make one's way without deception all the way to the present. Then they discovered origin as deception, thus choosing the form of deception into which they wanted to fall, and which would bedevil them to the last. Where it is not as though... Uh, origins can be necessarily located, at least I don't think, according to Calasso, but rather the origin is that which only is as such by its indeterminacy. So for that reason, any claim to do it, either in the form of an illusion, a simulacrum, or anything like that, would be in part um, part of its deception, part of its trick, part of its fundamental um, elusive nature. Now, this theory of origins runs parallel to how uh, Calasso describes um, Talleyrand, where he states that the nobility of the Talleyrand per Perigo is not a nobility of the spirit, nor is it attracted by the spirit. It is a biological nobility, which does not allow itself to be explained or justified, a thing that cannot be fully grasped, that cannot be fully understood. This allowed Talleyrand then to, according to Calasso, to move with the times, take on the current hue, change shirts, and oaths, which was just navigating the mediocrity of the system that he found himself in in the post-Napoleonic uh, age, where, uh, the, where the new rituals made him laugh because they were so shrill and clumsy as any new and secular rituals might be. So secular, that division of church and state, or that you know, claim towards um, rationality or whatever, the dissipation of myth or, or superstition, which for Talleyrand would probably, you know, that was for him, all humans really have is this connection to storytelling, this connection to, uh, to myth or superstition that guides us in our daily lives and to attach ourselves to 
some kind of scientific certainty is to simply go against what I will hesitantly call a real human condition. Colasso sees in Talleyrand, though, where he picks out of Talleyrand, uh, a really beautiful image where um, Talleyrand only really felt comfortable with one person, and for him that was his mother. And that was because his mother never relied on bon mot, or I guess high language, or, or good words, literally translated. So that, for Talleyrand, she had no pretensions whatsoever. She spoke only in nuances. She never uttered a bon mot. That would have been too outspoken. Bon mots are remembered. She w- and she wanted only to be pleasing and to let her words be forgotten. And that beautiful illustration, I think, I guess, let's, and, and there you, you know, you could read in this, into this a certain eatable thing. But Talleyrand, in a sense, modeled himself after his mother. Now, how his mother, uh, whether or not his mother had some kind of real affinity with the with, with ceremony or with the uh, pre-modern era uh, is difficult to say, and how that would have come about is certainly diff- would have been difficult to trace. But it's interesting, nonetheless, to think about how this relationship carried on through him. So there are moments in this when Colasso kind of sees in Talleyrand's whole family like something of a predisposition to this. So as I was stating earlier, as I was trying to make the point earlier, that any claim towards some kind of, um, I guess, systematic order, whether it be under the ages of science or, or order itself or under society, is for Talleyrand just a big uh, trick of the eye, right? It is just something that we would we cling on to, but it, has, it is as, in a sense, susceptible to change as anything else, except we refuse to acknowledge that. And for that reason, Talleyrand knows he can use lightness because things no longer have a fixed weight. They fluctuate, immense, vaporous, poisonous bodies. They do not rest in themselves. Nothing stands firm. There is nothing less corporal and more empty than the will, nor is it possible to find an immediately visible bond between that silent emptiness, pure compressed energy, and the rampant transformations that it provokes, often without granting any truce for the devastation. So, Colasso continues here by saying that among the many illusions that Talleyrand did not harbor was that of order. He never recognized order around himself, even though he worked to establish it, because he was in that uh, position in, in politics or in government. So it's um, because nothing is in and of itself perfect for Talleyrand, because it doesn't have that sort of symbolic relation or relation to ambiguity or myth, which seems counterintuitive because it would appear as though those systems were much more volatile, much more susceptible to crumbling. But it is precisely that um, that characteristic of any system that interests Talleyrand, and for Talleyrand, is, that is exactly what is the, the only certainty, the only certainty being uncertainty. So any attachment to that real, you know, and we can think of this in in for those that um, are much more versed with Baudrillard, and because I am, uh, we, we can think of this in terms of the real. So when the real comes into fruition, we know it's just a, a fake, right? The real existed for a very short period, and it is now disappearing, but it is something that does not mark finality in and of itself. What Talleyrand knew, and this is what others didn't, at least according to Classo, was the existence of limits. So some, someone else we're going to think about in this text, but a little later on, is Simon Weil, so French French philosopher, mystic, who um, in her book, uh, The Need for Roots, thinks about the way in which there are certain fundamental needs of any people to have an attachment to their um, their, their country, to their, to their sovereignty, in a sense. Uh, and for that reason, or at least this attachment to roots is important because it gives us a sense of meaning or it gives us a sense of grounding from which we can project ourselves. But not too far, of course. Limits are still placed above us and any attempt to circumvent those limits, to move past them, certainly one of the uh, staples of modernity to break down limits, keep going, 
moves us away from any sort of possible rootedness. Or in the French, any sort of racine. Beyond everything else, at least beyond all the other people that surrounded Talleyrand, the one person that stood most apart from him, in a sense, was Napoleon. So for Colasso, the relationship between Napoleon and Talleyrand was a fetish bristling with mirrors and nails. But one thing was clear, in their baffling complex bond, the immense curiosity that attracted them to each other. For years, they tried not to be let th- tried not to let this be seen, observing each other like two majestic beasts through the th- from the remote and disparate climes, and caged together in the same menagerie. So there's one story story that kind of illuminates their uh, their relationship. So Talleyrand had a house in the country, um, and one day Napoleon says to him, says I you know I'd love to come have a lunch with you. To which Talleyrand replies, Yes, of course, that would be lovely, and then we can do some shooting. To which Napoleon replies, no, I do, I do not like shooting. Shooting is not what I want to do. I want to hunt. And then asked Talleyrand if there were any wild boar there. But, a, but funny enough, funnily enough, uh, Napoleon was still a man from Paris, still a city boy, and did not understand that the place in which Talleyrand resided was just a small community with a little with a with a park, which was essentially what. Um, Talleyrand was referring to when he said go for a stroll or do some shooting and it would be utterly impossible or very unlikely to actually stumble across a a boar. So Talleyrand thought that this was incredibly amusing that uh, Napoleon would be naive enough to think that they'd be able to do hunting what would essentially be the I don't know um, the Brooklyn to Manhattan (laughs) I don't know maybe that's not the best analogy But Talleyrand found this quite amusing, so he thought to himself, what a perfect opportunity to really, I guess, take advantage of Napoleon's naivete. So what what Talleyrand did is he went to the market and bought several pigs. So when Bonaparte actually shows up on the day of their uh, reunion, um, Talleyrand sets one one of the pigs free, to at, at which point Napoleon jumps on his horse, gallops off with his other hunters, and after about half an hour or so, comes back with the with the pig, to which Talleyrand simply states, that is a pig, and that is not a boar. And of course, in response to this, Talleyrand, or Napoleon gets rather upset. He goes into, according to Colasso, uh, a violent rage, and then it took him six months after that to make peace with Talleyrand. Now, what this story highlights, I believe, is just how prepared Talleyrand was to make a mockery of anything, to really show that nothing had meaning in the way that people supposed that it would. So politics, identity, anything like that is all just fairy dust. In a sense, it floats. At least that's how it has has in the past. So any sort of attempt to ground it is just garbage. Right, so in pointing to, I guess, the fragility of Napoleon's masculinity in this in this moment, where Napoleon feels the urge to demonstrate it by hunting a, a boar, which he he had mistaken with a pig, it really makes apparent, I guess, the fragility of that very identity, because it can be taken away with a single word. That is, or single phrase, like, that is a pig, not a boar, despite all the effort that Napoleon had put in. And to kind of emphasize this point, Colasso presents a passage from uh, Madame de Rémusa, who said that one of the great faults of Bonaparte's mind was that it saw all men as essentially the same and did not see the differences that habits and customs produce in men's characters. So just considering epistemological variation here, ontological pluralism, uh, there is something to be said about, you know, just the presence of different identities and what that means in the face of, you know, um, I guess determining humans under the ages of whatever system you might have. So how it's all just, you know, comes down to the, uh, I guess, the um, arbitrary nature of the sign itself. So following the French Revolution or the Napoleonic or the entering of the post-Napoleonic era, um, 
those two things aren't exactly the same, but I will conflate them here. Uh, we see the birth of a new world. So kind of the, in terms of like, you can think about this in relation to Huxley and Brave New World. But for Colasso, he puts it as follows. Those new words would be written on a piece of flesh deprived of memory and would demand vastly increased bloodshed to inaugurate a world which was no longer largely uninhabited and no longer contained vast wild areas, but, but, which, but which had been thoroughly sifted and trampled by the excess of civilization, where even those spaces that are supposedly outside of civilization, they, um, parts of the world that we romanticize, like nature, whatever that is, only gains its status as such by being distinct from civilization. So, in that effect, it is then subsumed into the dialectic of the oppressive civilization mechanism. And this stands contrary to one example or one um, story about Adalbert von Chamiso, who was a poet and uh, botanist, who would travel around the world trying to understand things in proper uh, enlightenment fashion, and eventually stumbled across this one island where there were natives, there were indigenous people that would refuse to speak about the origins of their gods, which is of endless interest to uh, white colonial uh, settlers, because they have to know, right? Well, well, where do your gods come from? They ask in an effort to understand, and then swallow it, right? To then consume it. But the natives would not tell because they considered it blasphemy to talk about the origin of the gods, an idea that is lost on us, lost in our idea of civilization, precisely because there cannot be anything that cannot be explained, or there cannot be anything that we can just let not be explained. If there is something that is currently unexplained, we are currently working towards a way of understanding it. And we see another figure similar to Talleyrand in Goethe. So Goethe, at least quoted by uh, Talleyrand here, saying that, asking, demanding, isn't there a single person who understands that pictures represent something, that pictures work on the mind and feelings, make impressions, excite forebodings, mightn't they just as well have sent the most ghastly specter to meet this beautiful and pleasure-loving lady at the border? So in what way does signification play a role in the development of meaning, in the construction of meaning, that doesn't need to rely on some kind of biological certainty or whatever, or some kind of ontological certainty? But to this plea, Goethe's friends try to calm him, assuring him that nowadays nobody bothered to look for meaning in pictures, that to them at least nothing of the sort would have occurred, and that all people of Strasbourg and the surrounding towns who would gather there for the occasion would no more entertain such fancies than the queen herself and her court. So it's those attempts to revitalize a degree of mystery in the form of the sign, in the form of art, that is certainly lost. And this is really echoed today with... Uh, you can see where um, government funding is, is allocated to universities. I would, I think I'm pretty safe in assuming that it's not to the arts or the humanities, but to, you know, the sciences, right? We're, we're hard pressed. We, we must look for facts in the Dickensian type way, like in one of his, one of his books there in the factory. It's, a, it's about facts. We must find the facts. And that very much resonates today, especially in the current rhetoric, sadly. So now we come across, in our exploration of Colasso's text, another little story, another little piece of uh, uh, kind of a parable, where Talleyrand is now in America. So Talleyrand is in Connecticut, riding through the woods, where he stumbles across two people, a woodsman and a fisherman. But leading up to this, Talleyrand kind of contemplating what America is and coming into contact with certain people, he comes to this conclusion, or he thinks about it in this way, where... In those images he seemed to see, decomposing before his eyes, the improbable amalgam of civilization which was returning little by little to its simple elements. With every day that passes, he notes, or he noted, we lose sight of more of those inventions that our needs have made necessary as they proliferate. We seem to be traveling backward in the history of the progress of the human spirit. Which is a very beautiful um, way to put that, I think. In that we, you know, we have to ask, what effect has this proliferation of um, the satisfaction of needs or of desires? How has that actually made us 
realize more and more how little we need that. So entering like the kind of paradox of choice where it's like looking at, I'll take a rather vulgar example and just think about something like Netflix. Does Netflix actually make it um, our experiences of engaging with film easier or with movies easier? I would hardly think so. In fact, it opens up this whole array of choice where we spend more time looking for what to watch than actually watching, which takes us out of our element in some sense. So it's here that he comes into contact going through the woods with the woodsman and the fisherman, two exemplary figures for Talleyrand. So for the woodsman, according to Talleyrand, the American woodsman is interested in nothing. Any notion of sensitivity is foreign to him. Those boughs so elegantly sprouted by nature, the fine foliage, the bright color that enlivens a part of the forest, the deeper green that darkens another part, all this means nothing to him. He has no memories to call upon in any particular place. His only thought is for the number of axe strokes required to chop down a tree. He has never planned anything, planted anything. He does not know such pleasures. Any tree he might plant is worthless to him because he will never see it when it has grown sufficiently large to be chopped down. So he's speaking to, at least Colasso here is evoking this image of the woodsman to think about singularity in some way, where the woodsman is totally fine with a sort of adaptability. The woodsman, despite what might initially seem like a connection to um, a very real land, is not quite as um, neatly, uh, they, they aren't put together quite as neatly as we might think. Because, as Calasso makes clear, and so, or as Calasso makes clear in Talleyrand, and so long as he does not forget to take his axe with him, he has no regrets about leaving the spot he has dwelled in for years. So, very similar to Talleyrand and how we've been illustrating him so far, the woodsman does not have that connection to his self, his identity, his land, his roots, in the way that we might understand him to, and in the way that would make him successful. So like Talleyrand, he is prepared to give it up as long as he has the most basic thing that makes him what he is, giving him that singularity, the axe. And then the fisherman is almost no different, where the, the American fisherman acquires from his profession a spirit that is almost equally indifferent. His affections, his interest, his life lie on the margins of the society which he thinks he belongs. He would be prejudiced if we, we would be prejudiced if we believed that he is an especially useful member of it. For we must not compare these fishermen with those of Europe or believe that this is the way to train sailors to create sturdy, skilled men of the sea. So in that way, and then Talleyrand continues, they have no love for any particular place and know the land only by the ugly house where they live. Fishing can create only cosmopolitans. So interestingly, you know, and perhaps an argument could be made that these characters, these American figures, in their indifference are what creates Talleyrand in his indifference, even though he has that connection with his mother. But thinking about it as such, we can think about how the idea of America is in itself um, the land of indifference, the land of political indifference. And in that way, it is very much the figure of modernity that Talleyrand is so interested in. So seeing that these figures, the woodsmen and the fishermen, not only being part of the land, but destroying it in a very literal way and creating cities precisely by their um, producing or gathering the resources necessary to feed people that would eventually live in cosmopolitan areas, they occupy something of an ambiguous space. And in order to navigate that ambiguity, have to retain, have to take on this degree of indifference in order to survive in it. So from here, Talleyrand makes something, uh, turns the wheel, turns his gears, its direction a little bit, and thinks about the question of taste. So for taste, um, or as this chapter is titled, On Taste, he starts out by saying that taste comes into being in order to inherit. What, exactly? Hard to say, but surely, in all, civil, all the civilizations that the reactionaries dreamed of, taste did not exist. Meaning was enough to suppress it and meaning must sway on its foundations before taste can appear. So it is an efflorescence that gives no sign of ever recurring. It is short-lived and easily engulfed, but the effects of its appearance are irreversible. Its memory will not be effaced. So it is the seal 
on one's existence, the final replacement for wisdom that one cannot even allude to without displaying bad taste. Taste is like then, in very similar Baudrillardian fashion, is like a mirror reflected in a mirror. What once upheld the opposites without being visible becomes the only thing that vision can grasp or moving beyond. Taste develops after the meaning has been squashed, in a sense, when things would have a certain impact based not only on their public opinion, right, but on their being justly right, so the good. So there is some Plato here, I think, where taste develops as a sort of democratic type response to the loss of meaning or the loss of a sort of singularity. So taste being part of that kind of democrat democ democratization democratization Christ presents a foray for Calasso's thoughts about equality, which for him is a terrible idea. So again, we hear Plato here. So for Calasso, equality is an initiatory idea. Only through a highly artificial process such as initiation can one succeed in evoking the equal, an entity that does not exist in nature. So how do we square this? Because, well, if I were to bifurcate or present just two options, we have either the one that Calasso would appreciate or would privilege, that idea of the non-egalitarian or the possibility of there being hierarchy in the form of um, a sort of symbolic organization of community or anything like that, which would be totally necessary, or there is democracy in a sense, uh, in, in its ideal form, obviously not the way in which we see it today. Now for him, that would democracy would just be a step into banality, a step away from any sort of ceremony, which is a key thing for him, and would be instead a drive towards the masses, a drive towards, I guess, the re reduction of all people to nothingness, where at one point some people had some kind of status, now it's no people have any status. So on this on this note, Calasso once again turns to Talleyrand, who says that our times are characterized by the fact that within what we call society, certain things are coming to a definitive end. There was a time when a famous salon or a person or a person influential because of his wit or judgment could be replaced. Today we see clearly only what we have lost. What will be born is still hidden. Thus, despite all the bravado of the young, the present time seems to me the golden age of the old, and this proves it is society itself that is ending. So it's from here that I'll want to move into uh, The Ruin of Cash. This is the title of the book and the title of the following chapter, or one of the following chapters. So at this point, there is a shift in the direction of this book. So it moves away, in a sense, from Talleyrand, which we should keep in the back of our mind as the, kind of the master of ceremony or the master of dedication or the master of sort of indifference, to think about this old story of the Ruin of Catch, which I will summarize. So there are four kings that rule or that ruled the great realm of Cash, the first in Nubia, the second in Habesh, the third in Kordofan, the fourth in Four. So the richest of them was was the Nap of Nafta in Kordofan. Now this king or this ruler of Nafta, the Nap of Nafta, although the richest, led the shortest life of the rest of them, because the king or the ruler was only allowed to hold that position for a certain number of years. At the end point of which they would be sacrificed, they would be killed. So every night during his reign, the priests studied the stars, offered sacrifices, and built fires. They could not miss a single evening of their prayers and sacrifices, otherwise they would lose sight of the celestial trajectories and would not know when, according to the star's dictates, the king was to be killed. And so it went for a long time. Day after day, year after year, the priests studied the stars and recognized the day on which the king had to be killed. So for many years, the king enjoyed all the riches that this kingdom bestowed upon him. Precisely because it was the richest kingdom, he could be the happiest. But as the final days drew near, he grew gloomy, he grew sad, he grew distraught. 
precisely because he knew that the end was coming. So to try and make himself feel better, he called for a man named Falima, or Falimas, not sure how you pronounce that, who was summoned and came to the court. The king said, Falimas, today is the day you must make me happy. Tell me a story. No sooner said than done, Falimas replied and began telling a story. The king listened. The guests listened. The king and the guests forgot to drink. They forgot to breathe. The slaves forgot to serve. Falimas's story was like hashish. When he finished, all were immersed in pleasant oblivion. King Akaf had forgotten his thoughts of death. None of those present had noticed that Falimas had been talking straight through the night. By the time the guests took their leave, the sun was already high. End. The next day, King Akaf and his guests were impatient for evening to come so that Falimas could begin his story. Now Falimas had to tell a story every night. The news of the fables of Falimas spread throughout the court, the capital, and the country, and each time Falimas told a better story. Each day the king gave him a beautiful garment, and the guests and the ambassadors gave him gold and precious stones. When he walked through the city, a swarm of slaves followed him. The people loved him. The people began to bear their breasts before him. So it is through Falimas' stories, it is by the effects that it induces on those listening, that the king gleans a brilliant idea. Precisely because his death will only come about by analyzing the stars, by gazing their trajectories from, which is a, uh, a way for which, by which God may communicate to the people, to the priests. The king believes if he can have the priests listen to the story for but a single night, they will lose track of the trajectories of the stars, and they will no longer be able to tell when the king will have to be sacrificed. And very willingly, the priests came because they thought no such storyteller existed. And that night, like every other, Falimas told a story, and the priests, like everyone else, fell into a bliss, fell into oblivion, a sort of unconscious sleep state from which they were immersed in the story itself. When morning arrived, they were not prepared for what would befall them. So the priest stated, we were but unprepared for that evening, and we must try it again if we are to truly believe that this storyteller has the ability to take us away from the stars, from analyzing them. And the next evening, like the one before, the priest fell asleep and did not have the time to look at the stars. So to this, the priests state that the only way for this to be undone is if Falimas is sacrificed, because Falimas is demonstrating that he has a will greater than that of God, precisely because Falimas is able to get the attention of the priests more effectively than God can. But King Akaf, the king is not satisfied with this and states that I will still suffer the consequences of the end of my term if you feel that Falimas should be killed. To which the priests reply, we must try one more evening and see if it is true that this storyteller has the real ability to take us away from God, to which the result is the same as every other night, where they fall into a deep, blissful sleep and do not wake up till morning. So, as Colasso writes, from that day on, no one else was ever killed in Nafta. King Akaf was the first king to Nafta to live until it pleased God to take him at an advanced age to his bosom. When King Akaf died, Falimas was his successor. Under him, Nafta reached the peak of its happiness and its end. This is the story of the ruin of the land of Kash. Its last remaining sons live in the land of Four. So, the cities disappeared. Of Nafta's glory years, nothing remained but the tales of Falimas, which he had brought with him from the land beyond the eastern sea. So Falimas was effective then at destabilizing the order of the city, the order of the kingdom, through the act of storytelling. So the law can be observed by a single subject. Sacrifice demands a dual subject. For this reason, in the law we recognize the exoteric side of sacrifice. Esoteric in its nature, sacrifice can only give way to storytelling, which vanquishes it in an ordeal involving both. From afar, Falimas and Sali appeared to be the heroes of a new order based on revolt against sacrifice. Seen close up, Falimas and Sali are elements of the sacrifice that defeat 
other elements of the sacrifice. And the word of Farley Moss is the Soma. So the Soma being uh, relating to Hinduism, kind of the um, same in, in like a Brave New World, that kind of um, endorphin releasing feel good drug. So this is one of the most enigmatic stories that I've ever come across, especially in relation to this text. So what does it mean? Well, at first glance, it might appear, as Colasso makes clear, that this marks an entry into a new order, that is, one more closely aligned with uh, modernity, where old structures that operate under the law of sacrifice or, or divine intervention or whatever are overthrown by a sort of um, humanist or liberal type approach to to knowledge or to understanding where there is an opening up. Now, Colasso isn't totally satisfied with taking on that perspective, as he says, where it's seen up close. Farley Moss and Sally are elements of the sacrifice that defeat other elements of the sacrifice. So we can see it instead as something of a transposition, where the kingdom itself must be sacrificed, not as though to simply enter into a new sphere or oppressive one, but just another... Um, manifestation of that old system, of that old structure. So, as Colasso identifies, storytelling is the esoteric of the esoteric, the secret of the secret. It teaches us how to live outside the cycle, in the hashish-like suspension of the world, of the word. It is the way of life that comes to light after the defeat of sacrifice, yet it retains the gesture of sacrifice diluted in all gestures. So rather than simply understanding it in the way that I outlined as being the precursor to a repressive modernity, instead we must understand it in these terms as being almost uh, like an autoimmune, serving something of an autoimmune function, where there was almost too much of a solidification, a crystallization of a cultural identity in, in NAPTA that had to be sacrificed in order to open itself up to a sort of change, to a recourse towards something else which is one of the fundamental properties of the pre-modern era, at least according to Colasso, is being open to that very possibility of adaptation or what have you. So for that reason, it's, it's extremely enigmatic, and I think it can be read in any number of ways quite clearly. And for any of those listening, I'd be really curious to see what everyone else thinks, because I, like, I really love it, I think it's a beautiful story, but it's rather... It's enigmatic, as I said, as I've said about a hundred times now. So as Colasso continues, sacrifice is the end and sacrifice is the means. Sacrifice is what is read and what allows reading. This is the vibrant circle of the old order. So for that reason, Farley Moss is not opposed to sacrifice, which is an important um, clarification. And this is really interesting because sacrifice is what allows things to come into being in that way in its opening up of kind of by getting rid of something something is opened up and that might be a little bit of a too vulgar way to put it and that could open up many really terrible interpretations but in the way in a way i feel like that's what Colasso is getting across here so we see a dual function here or we see two different possibilities where the legend of cash teaches us that sacrifice is the cause of ruin, but that the absence of sacrifice is also the cause of ruin, because we can interpret Farley Mouse's stories as a sacrifice and a lack of sacrifice precisely because it gets rid of the very literal act of sacrificing a person, which does not mean that sacrifice cannot manifest itself in other ways, which is in exceptionally interesting because it demands us to question the certainty that this kind of repressive modernity has been wholly effective at eliminating the, some of the components of the quote-unquote old order or the way in which people once organized rather than simply understanding it as a transposition of that order. So it's on that note and we get through uh, probably about the first half or so. If we have, No, I guess not the first half, a little less than that. Uh, but Getting into this text here, um, from this point on, Colasso will look at a bunch of different things. So he'll spend a lot of time on sacrifice, ceremony, 
but then he also draws his attention towards contemporary thinking. So he really goes after Marx. And that's a very interesting analysis, and I hope to get into that next time. But for now, for anyone who listened to this, like, for those of you that haven't heard of this guy, really check him out. This will probably be the only book of his I do, because the other ones are extremely aphoristic. They're really just stories um, dealing with Greek myth or um, or uh, Hinduism. But then there are a number of other theoretical texts, like the 49 Steps, which is just chapter after chapter, just just a collection of essays which is difficult to analyze in sequence because there isn't really a recurring thread throughout it.